So, my name is Robert, and the first links that you see here, the profile, the GitLab, um, whenever somebody does something, doing a talk, the first person that they do it for is themselves. Um, so, I put a lot of technical stuff, and I was going through a dry run through on the presentation, and I realized that if I talk the way I normally talk, I'll never get to the scripts that really are the important part of the talk. So, I'm trying to keep myself tough and scheduled on this shit. My problem is, is I talk too much. Tell me to shut up, that'll help me speed up. Um, on the bottom is the GitLab. It has the documentation of the slides and it also has little scripts. And without further ado, I will now begin the talk about Barmat. First questions, those people with experience less than six months with Postgres, raise your hands. Okay, uh, less than two years. Also yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, I've always found it a challenge. I have a preference. I like to go slow to make sure that the slowest person stays up to speed. But then I was always used to be told by my boss that says, no, you got to go at the speed of the fastest people. The ones who are slowest, if you've done your groundwork, they'll catch up on their own time. So, let's hope that that works out this way. I'm going to try to use concepts and terms that are familiar with the Postgres with the community, the vocabulary. There is documentation in here. If you see something, when you see something you can't figure out, you got two choices. Shoot up your hand, ask a question, or note it and you do a follow-up. The objective of this slides is that this presentation isn't going to teach you how to do something. It's going to open the door and the real learning is going to be afterwards, if you choose. Yes? Is this similar to Amman? Oracle's Amman? Yes. Okay, so I'm a little concerned about where I should be when I talk to the microphone so it sees me. I got my little clicker. I like to wander up, so I guess I'm sort of stuck here in the corner. It's oh. be directional. As long as it has the range, because sometimes I'll turn my back. Okay, so first point. Yes, my name is Robert. For those who speak French, bye-bye. <laughs> uh, I've already pointed out where the presentation is, and this is the biggest problem. There's too much information. How to commit triage, how to give you what you need to proceed on your own according to your own taste. What's your takeaway? So we have Postgres concepts, environment concepts, you're creating and managing the environment. The talk's about basically there's an environment that was created to be able to acquire the material to present this. Part of the presentation is going to say, oh, this is how I built the silly thing to test the silly thing. Uh, underline two basic backgrounds. Familiarity, comfort with Postgres, familiarity with Linux. Personally, I have three criteria. One, yes, Linux, yes, Postgres, and a programming language. And if you're really primitive, it would be C. Because the developers, the core, they think in C, and when they really do cutting edge stuff, they don't refine their documentation enough, and you can see some of the stuff, you can see the C way of saying things. As crazy as that sounds in these modern days, you may not recognize it anymore. Look at Jurassic Park, you'll figure it out. Now, uh, from what I've gathered here, we have a lot of people here who are not necessarily expert with Postgres, but you're getting to it, you're getting comfortable with it, okay. The reference on the bottom, the barman reference is superb, excellent, excellent uh, referencing. The biggest challenge that you're going to have here is about vocabulary and concepts, just getting through the stuff. I have got 20 slides, 90% of those slides I have to get through in 10 minutes. 10 minutes after that, I'm going to start going through a script on how to use barman, the actual copy-paste routine. And then after that, another 10 minutes or so, talk about the build environment. Okay, here's the takeaway. If you've ever watched Dr. Cool, uh, Dr. Who, think in those terms. Barman is cool. It is really, really spectacular what you can do with it. You're not reinventing the wheel. There is nothing new in Barman that you can't do as a Postgres DB on your own. What it is, is it simplifies the process by orders of magnitude. It is a disaster recovery tool. It is meant to protect your job. 
because I imagine people get fired when they destroy their database. Uh, I work for a company called Zonar Systems, and I am responsible for several hundred terabytes. If I want to destroy that company, which by the way earned over $120 million last year, I can do it in 20 seconds. So I have to be very, very careful because they have very good lawyers. <laughs> um, Barman can be operated remotely. It can be on its own server. It doesn't have to be connected uh, onto the same Postgres servers. It can handle a cluster of Postgres servers, not just one. It deals with your regular routines. You're going to have mishaps. Or you're going to want to create environments for teams or people or for yourself. It can do all of that. It can take a single server, it can copy it, put it somewhere, and you can have it all to yourself and work it. It is great. It simplifies the process. There are certain other tools, other processes, other instructions that do the same thing. But if you can learn to work with Barman, you can, it's, it goes beyond disaster recovery. It's, it's literally bordering on administrating Postgres on a cluster. And an average person, smart, some awareness with Linux, some comfort with Linux, you can get away with it. All you need to do is just get over that little hump of a learning curve. Now, typically in Postgres, we have backup policies, not just disaster recovery purposes, but backup policies. Traditionally, we have data dumps, logical dumps. That's PG dump, PG dump all. You get things at a frequency. You get it one every day, after the end of the week, you, have, you keep on one for the week, after the end of the month, you keep one for the month, and it goes on and on and on and on, and you rotate. There are issues with that problem. My issue, for example, I have several hundred terabytes. Well, you know what? PG dump isn't going to cut it. Not that way. I do one cluster, and it takes 24 to 30 hours to do a dump. It has to be done. It's a, it's a, it's, it's used for edge cases, it's used for special requests for development teams, it's used as a last resort when something blows up and that's all you've got left. Barman is the go-to. It will back up and protect the data and restore it. If it's configured in the way that you choose, you can have it restore data up to just the data cluster or up to the latest transaction within seconds. Of, of server failure. Everything with Barman is about the configuration files. It's not the command line invocations. It's about setting up the configuration files. Barman, you turn it on, you give it a couple of arguments, and poof, it reads the files, it makes the decisions, and it acts. Full recovery. On the bottom here, we uh, manual and automated. What you see at the end there, right there and on the manual is barman backup all. Barman is a command line utility. Barman, if you did barman dash H, you would get something like a kilobyte of help coming back at you. You'd have to page it to be able to see it. It is complex, it is detailed. Again, it's about being comfortable with the way of doing things. If you're old school, and people are dying now, so there's not too many of those left. Um, you would read command line interface, you'd page it, and you'd see it on a terminal, and you'd see all this stuff. It is piping. It is going from one command into another command into another command. It is redirect. It is Linux 101. Master Linux, and you've mastered most of this stuff. Automated with the argument cron, this goes into cron tab, which means every so often, barman will just kick up, and it'll do everything, read the configuration file, and does what it has to do. Partial recoveries. This is cool. This is a technology that was incorporated in Postgres some time ago. Uh, we had point in time recovery, which means not only could you restore a, da a data cluster, a database system to the point of failure, but you could po point it up just before, either by a timestamp or by a transaction ID. Imagine, you walk into the office, you come in at 9, at 9.30 a mistake is made because it is master-slave configuration. You've made a command and it's gone. You've dropped a, a database, you've changed an intrinsic portion of the system. You don't discover it until 10 o'clock. By using Barman, by taking advantage of Postgres's point in time recovery capabilities, you can recover, reconstitute the entire database up to just before you gave that silly little command and recover everything else. 
I'm not covering that. I'm saying it can be done. The problem with a talk like this is it's easy. It's easy to go down these rabbit holes. There's so much you can do. I make jokes at the office uh, when people talk about their skill background and their technical knowledge and their education. I just answer, well, I say, I just use the force. Because basically, you, you do this long enough, it gets to be a thing. It just becomes part of you. And you find out you can be very, very creative. There are many ways to solve a problem. It's hard to go down all of them because there are so many options. Okay, so in Barman, you create what's called a base backup. The base backup is the actual data cluster. It copies everything. That's all it is. It's a, it's a simple copy. But you're doing this under production conditions. Asset compliance means that you are recording the instructions before it gets committed to the tables. That comes out in what's known as wall archiving, the walls, right ahead logs. There's a two-pronged process going on. It doesn't have to occur at the same time, but they both have to occur. One is the commit of the base backup. The other one is the recording and the shipping, the eventual archiving of the right ahead logs. There are two broken down methods doing that. One is log shipping, a traditional way. A right ahead log in Postgres, the default is 16 megabyte files. The other way that came out just a few years ago, and for me, it doesn't seem that long ago, but for most other people, it's been a while now, is called streaming replication. It's a protocol where you can have a client connect into the Postgres system, and you will get the actual instructions that are going into these walls. But you're reading it from a client application, which means you can redirect it and process it. That's streaming replication. This allows you to basically record everything up to the very moment there's a failure on the system. So we have these two methods of wall archiving. And Barman is interesting. It can not only do a standalone, you can not only get a backup from the master, you can do it from a slave. And the little demo that I set up to do this, that's exactly what I did. What am I doing on top? I got three minutes. Okay, so. These are snapshot images straight from the Barman documentation. They are so good that I'm taking credit for it. Okay, now, what we've got are variations of Barman configuration issues. Basically, what we've got are three step instructions. They are all, in this first one, is the default, the simplest, the most basic, unimaginative way that Barman can talk to a Postgres server. Three types of communications, all initiated by Barman. The first one is it has a command and control user account. It goes in, goes to Progress, Postgres and says, hey, I'm going to take over, I'm going to do a backup. The second one is the streaming backup. That's the actual copy of the data cluster. The third communication is the, the wall, transmitting the wall. There are many ways of doing this wall streaming. There are many varieties. It's all a question of configuration, both in Postgres and in Barman. It's, it, it's just amazing. Um, now, just to confirm, the streaming backup is a non-locking online uh, backup. Is that's that right? right. Everything here is passive. This system is under, is under production use. It does not block. It does not interfere. This is a copying process from a mechanism that is apart from Postgres. This is another variation. If you notice right on the bottom, a little red there, that is log shipping, but instead of using that utility, you see the, the, the receive log? That's, that's a utility that Postgres has and also that Barman implements in its own client uh, utilities. The third one in red, that's our syncing. That's using an archive command parameter in the Postgres server itself. It doesn't have to be rsync. It could be a secure copy. It could be even an ordinary copy on an NFS mount. It's, it's really, really easy. This is an interesting variation, and the most common use, I've used this before, is when I don't trust the network. I'm not in very good terms with these sysadmins because I tell them I don't trust them. But uh, what happens is, is that this takes into account by having a separate mechanism. When you lose connection, it is possible to configure the system to wait to resume connections. 
if it doesn't happen, if you run out of time, if those timeouts go, this method kicks in. Postgres holds onto walls until the connection is resumed again, and it'll ship it. If this client connection, the one that's managed by Barman isn't available, it'll use this method, the RSync. Now this is the traditional way. It's basically rsyncing. It's using the archive command, and it is Postgres that's sending everything. Everything in red here, these two commands here and here. Again, these methods, these variations, they're all available in Postgres, they're all available in Barman. It is all a question of configuration. And there's another variation. Again, there's tons and tons. And I am now going on to 15 minutes. Okay, so here's the demo environment. This environment is created on my machine. I have a Windows machine. I'm using VirtualBox with Linux. I'm using Kubuntu. In there, I'm using Linux containers. Linux containers are then implementing servers. These servers are, th are three Postgres servers and one barman administrator. This is a master-slave relationship, and this one is just empty. There's no data cluster there. It's just there for our purposes. That's going to be our recovery target. That's where we're going to put our barman, uh, our data cluster from recovering. Now, keep the following points. Master-slave relationship, clustered relationship in Postgres. He has data cluster of any time, any kind of database system. It's meant for either high performance or high availability. It is not for disaster recovery. If a, an instruction is made on the master, it gets replicated to the slave, and that's it. There is one exception, and that's if you intentionally configure the system to delay those changes to the slave. Again, you've got choices on choices on choices. May the force be with you. <laughs> OK. So again, here's a reiteration of the demo environment. What I want to point out is I hate Docker. Uh, you can see the Postgres hosts. Barman, I call them Barman PG1, PG2, PG3. Barman host, Barman. All packages came from the Postgres community repo. They were all installed on all packages. There was variations. Here's a big tip. When these accounts are created, on the barman, you're going to have an account called barman. On Postgres, you're going to have Postgres. Put private public keys across the entire system. There, is, con there are configurations that don't even require them. But in the real world, if you have these, you've got fail safes. Now, just so far what I've talked about, I want you to understand, there's probably about four or five different ways to do the same silly thing and one of those ways may break, you'll have another way to deal with it. Always take the practice, if you can, public-private keys. All the Postgres servers should be able to talk to each other. You should be able to log in with SSH. Barman should be able to log into all Postgres servers. All Postgres servers should be able by SSH to log in the Barman server. The secret to working it out is the configuration. The configuration files on Barman are key. You read the documentation on Barman, yes. You go through the GitLab repo that I've got here, you see the configuration files, yes. And you can play with it. All right, what else we got here? This is a structure that I've created for the demo environment. Everything that ends right here in template, these are provided by default by, post, uh, by Barman. This is on the Barman server. Right there, Barman server in the Etsy directory. When Barman is installed, it creates a directory called barman.d and it creates a configuration file called barman.conf in Etsy. When it ends in conf, Barman reads it. If it's in an, in an extension other than .conf, it won't read it. So when this is first created, all it has are templates. Your starting point is you read this, you edit, and then when you're ready, you turn it into a conf. When you invoke barman, barman will read these configuration files in the directories. It goes down there and says, oh, this is a conf file. I must read it. 
So in this case, I've named barman PG1, PG2. This I never used, you can see it because it's still a template. Now, what's special about this is I'm doing backups on both, and I'm doing two different techniques. One of them, PG1, is I'm using SSA server. That's the older method. I'm using an RSync, and I, that requires public-private keys. The slave is using streaming. Now, you can have them both use the same technique, or you can both have them different. I thought it was just cool by having them different. This one down here, barman pg underscore pg1, pg data, this is a Postgres directory structure. These are the three files that you need to be concerned about for, uh, the, for, for, for Postgres. The one here, auto.conf, you don't touch. That is affected, that is edited by using the SQL command alter system. But the other two, you touch. You physically have to edit. And I am officially five minutes behind. So, uh, again, these are the files. These are show the actual commands. So I'm going to go on here. Barman has three command line utilities. There are two packages in the Debian version implementation of Linux. One has the Barman service package by itself. The other one has Barman command line implications. As you can see, the first one, you should, you must have that on Barman itself. Optionally, you can have the other configurations, the other tools on Barman, but they are most useful on the Postgres servers. Now, what I'm going to do is copy-paste. I'm going to refer to the GitLab repo that I've got, and I have my running environments, and I'm going to make sure that this silly thing works. So I'm going to go to my containers. Let's see. There we go. And first things first. There we go. I'm logged in my barman. And let's do a little copy paste. This is the, uh, the GitLab repo that I put up uh, yesterday, as a matter of fact. And I'm going to go on to the readme of the example. So basically what I've got here are little snippets. These snippets work with the demo environment that's been created. You go in and backups have already been done. So we already got things to look at. So let's see how this works out here. There we go. So here's our first test. Yes? Are you able to increase the uh, font size? for? Oh, yes I can. This is Linux. All right, uh, comments from the back. Big enough? Smaller? Keep going? All right, let's do this. And all right. How's that? Bigger? I can still do bigger. How's that? That's good for me. Okay. All right then. So this is basically I'm iterating, going through. This, that. So as you can see here, this is simple bashism. Uh, I'm iterating through the Postgres servers and I'm testing the replication. This is a standard little command line tool, uh, SQL, just to go in to see, hey, is streaming replication active? Yes or no. And you can see when it comes back with these numbers. PG1, PG2, yay, it works. Next one, uh, here we go. Okay, oops, here we are. Now, let me show you this before I proceed. So, we are working with one single command line utility on the barman server. It is called barman. And when you do your help, this is all the wonderful things that you can do with that single command. There's a lot of options here. So the best what I'm going to try to do is only go through some of them. It's not exhaustive. It's not complete. It's just get comfortable with the style. The barman documentation on Barman's site is very, very good. It will break down each and every single argument and tell you what it can and can't do. Okay, let's go through this one. Let's 
Yeah. Status. Yeah, this is the one I want. Okay, let's do, make that a little clearer. So, here's a little trick. What this has done is I have gone and I have said, okay, please go to the master and check everything that depends on that master and tell me how they're synced. Does anybody know what these mean? Right there, you see those little the strings, hexadecimal strings? Anybody have an understanding? It's all vague? Excellent, perfect, and I can tell you what it is. What happens is, Postgres tracks all transactions. We need a universal transaction method, a way to convert that so we can see what write-ahead log it's located in, what file it's in. I can take these and I can run a function call, and I will in a second, on any Postgres server. It doesn't even have to belong to this demo, and it'll give me the name of the wall. It's a generic global method, which is really cool. This tells me if the slave is in sync with the master. That's what these lines are. These tell me the master's at this rate, the slave's at this rate. Now, because there's only one slave, only one line can generate. If there was more, there'd be more done. And in this case, that would be this right here. Oops. Let's see what I have. Barman. Oh, duh. Don't you dare. No good demo goes unpunished. Yeah. Okay, there we go. If you were to go into the transaction log directory, and I can show you that for a second, that file exists. It's a real file. That's the name. And let's see if I can do it this way. Yes, there it is. And these are examples. Can you see that? These are walls. These are the transaction logs. On the right panel, that's the barman host. On the left panel, that is actually one, uh, one of the data clusters. That's, that's what's copied over. So after, after everything works, after everything is running, the base backup has been taken, that's, that's the, the real information that's going in real time, being created and being shipped over. It's being saved in the form of uh, write-ahead logs. Okay, next. So, let's go and look at our first backup invocation. This is the key. This is the whole reason why we're having this presentation. When you have a sub-argument, whatever it is, in this case it's called backup, you can see that it'll break it down even further. So that the initial comment, barman with H, that was one set of instructions. This is another. And it goes further and further and further. And I hope I'm not boring the shit out of you. <laughs> OK. So and there. OK. I've just given the command to go through all the configured uh, clusters and to copy them, to back them up. So it's pretty automatic. This is what it looks like. On the right panel is the barman host. There. Those are folders for individual configuration files, individual hosts. Each one has its own history. So I go in here, and it breaks it down further. You can see base. That's where the actual base backup was taken. 
errors, error messages, of course, incoming. Depending on the technology used, that's where the walls go in before they're stored permanently. Barman will actually take them, put them in the incoming, and then shove them somewhere else. Streaming is the alternate, depending on the technology. It's either log shipping or it's using the streaming replication. And at the end of the day, that's where they go, in the walls. And then they break it down. Now, Barman is organized. You see the, the number on that folder? Well, you remember back there, the right ahead log, it had that long series of numbers? Barman takes the first 16 digits and turns that into a directory. Every so often, the directory rotates. It, it, it increments. For, it, it's the way it organizes, the way it decides to do things. Then it'll start shoving the walls in there. Okay, here we go on the variation. Another little bashism. Okay, what we've done is we've queried and asked what is your state for every server and we just paged it out. If there's a problem, typically on a console in Linux, there's going to, the line will come up in red. There'll be something funny about it. It'll, it'll come up and warn you about things. Typically, though, this is the color that it would look like when it runs well. And you can see there's the command that I used. So it was iterate, barman list server. The minimal switch just gave me the name of the server. Then I just iterated through. And then I used it in barman show server, which gives me the information. Another variation. Oops. When you run this the first time before you do your first backup, some of them will actually come out red. Typically, it's going to be the wall level. It doesn't necessarily mean it's broken. Sometimes you have to run a backup before she'll go green. Uh, colors aren't being shown at this point because I'm paging them through less. So if I get rid of that and run it, there we go. You can see the color. List backup. Okay. Can everybody see that? Do you want? Is that big enough? Okay. Now. Inside each folder on the barman server is a backup. Those backups are identified by a timestamp. These are the names of the directories. You can see here that I did it on year 2009, April 28th, some of them April 27th, some of them April 26th, plus a timestamp, which means that if you do a base backup and you're running tests on a small base backup and only takes a few seconds to do, you just keep doing it over and over again and you'll make a unique directory having those base backups. This is what it looks like in the directory. So there. And that applies to every server, every configuration. It'll hold on to versions. Now, Barman has the ability to rotate these things out. It will, on its own, purge them. You have rules. You can either have them purged by how old they are, or you can have them purged by how many copies of backups that you have. You've got all sorts of options, and they're all decided in the configuration files themselves. Here's another one. Backup. Oops. And this is a history. When I run the, this command, and I'll show it again, I've just gone through both servers. What this does, this is really good information. It tells me not only when it was done, doesn't tell me the size, but Barman is always taking in walls. It needs only a small section of those walls. During the base backup, it needs walls 
that you have to turn on the server to synchronize, to sync. Until it reads all those walls, you don't know, you will not be able to access it, it will not be able to interact, you won't be able to do anything with it. It won't be in sync. These are past backups. They actually tell you which walls belong to that cluster to make it synchronous, to make it accessible. Anything past the wall, the oldest one for example, uh, the end wall, anything past that, if you've got your history, that's the grave. That's the stuff that comes after the backup. That's what Postgres sends to the barman and is recorded. That is what you'll be able to track and ingest when you do a recovery server. One of the challenges we have at the company right now is we're doing a migration. And part of the migration routine isn't using barman. Some of our servers are very, very inconsistent compared to the others. So we use this, we say, okay, now we know how many, we know our network band, we know how long it's gonna take. This is how much our third party vendor is gonna charge for us because we know how long it's gonna take us to get this done. This is the final one. This is the one that makes the whole point of Barman. Let's see if I can do this here. Okay. Recover. I had a third server, Barman PG3. That service was empty. There was nothing there. All it had was the Postgres binaries. When you do a recovery, you take Barman, you select a backup version, and you give it instructions. You can make it a standalone. You can say, okay, only copy that version of that backup just to the point where it's synced. You can create a, ser a server that's standalone with the most recent data in it. It could come up to a certain time stamp, a certain transaction ID. You could even turn it into a slave. The slave can point to the existing master, or you can even have that slave point to Barman, and Barman will feed it information, not the other servers. Let me show you what it would look like. I, let's see, okay, can everybody see this invocation right here? Uh, let's see, can you read it in the back? I can make it bigger. Can you scroll up to the top? Yeah. Let's see if I can make this a little smaller, and that'll help a little bit. There, how's that? Okay, so this is typically on one line. I just use the backslash because I'm a neat freak. Um, what happened was, logged in the barman. We're going to recover one of the backups. We're using a remote SSH command. This is because that PG3 that third server doesn't have a running Postgres. You can't log into it. You can't come in as a super user. You have to log in under SSH and execute commands on the command line. That's why you need this. That's why you need pri uh, private public keys. So it's gonna log in. This is the option. Standby mode says, hey, turn this into a slave. Then I'm pointing. I'm pointing to take the backup copy, take it from the master take it from this particular time, and oh, by the way, when you go on to the remote server, this is the path that you're gonna use. When you use the command barman recover.h, uh, h, you're gonna see there's a lot, a lot of options. It's, uh, it's re to really get good at this, you have to play with the environment. You really have to play with the environment to get a good feel of it. Um, just, one little thing I'll show you here before I move on to the last thing. Okay, barman, yeah. Come. Okay, let's go and visit that host. Okay, now, when you configure a, a Postgres server to work as a standby, to work as a slave, a read-only slave, it's like Barman. 
it makes its decision based on a configuration file. In this case, the configuration file is called recovery.conf. Barman created this file. When I gave it the option standby, this file is an instruction. It says, okay, I'm going to turn on the server. I'm going to read all future walls to make this server current. And I'm reading it from this directory uh, from barman xlog. And then it has a recovery end command, which is to basically purge that directory. Well, that's not necessarily true. That directory doesn't exist on that server. When you do some of this stuff, you may have to do further work. I'm, I, I showed you to this point, it's not complete in its own right. If I turn on this server, it actually does work. It works as a read-only environment. You can actually query it, but it only has a backup copy. It doesn't sync all to the most current data, and it will not maintain updates. You can do it that way, but it means playing with this. And that's outside the purview of, of, of the presentation I have here. Okay, so I've talked very quickly. Um, thank you, Starbucks. <laughs> and one, one last, I'm going to ask for questions right now because the one last thing I want to do was the part I really spent the most time on and that was actually coming up with the instructions to query the silly, create the silly uh, demo environment so that you'd have an idea of what was done. Questions, please, what are they? <laughs> All right, that is one of two things. It means you are dead or it means that I've done a wonderful job. So uh, one question for you is, uh, Barman, does it support uh, different storage backends like S3 or NSF or anything like that as far as uh, remote storage backends? Barman is a traditional technology. It makes an assumption that it's accessing a traditional file system. However, there's enough hooks, there's enough variability in Postgres that you can actually create a system to do just that. I haven't got a document. It's like, you ever hear the, the, how the movie Forrest Gump was made? They said, somebody came up with this storyline, says let's have this story about this guy who comes into ridiculous situations and, you know, he's shaking hands with John F. Kennedy and all that. Can you do that? Well, you know, the people who were behind the technology there, they said, oh yeah, oh yeah. And then they walk out of the meeting and they said, how the fuck are we going to do that? <laughs> they developed the technology. All I'm saying at this point is, what you've asked, I don't know how it's going to be done, but I know it can be done. There are enough hooks, there are enough variabilities, there are enough modules, there's enough out there in the community. If you can, rule us up, if you can explain a desire or a need, and you can do it in less than 15 seconds, Take it as a given, it can be done. The challenge is to say it well and to say it simply. The question that you asked, following that rule, yes. Yes? How would you go about doing the restore using this? Um, change some of the system type parameters as you do the restore? Because what, what you explained there, up, up came a running database that was usable within the realms that you told it how to configure it. Yes. But say, for instance, you want to restore a um, smaller version of production, how, how would you manipulate uh, the, this system to, to make it, um, I don't know, not allocate, allocate 500 pieces of memory or something, or whatever else you might want to do? I'll show you the answer right now. Just broadly. Uh, I'm, I'm, no, no, it's, it, it won't go into... Did you edit that? Uh, let's see if I can do this. Where are we here? We're in Barman. Okay, these configuration files, uh, these are edited versions of the, of the configuration. Can you say where you are? Okay. What server you're on? Which right now on the right panel, this is a remote access into the demo barman server. Okay. This is a customized configuration file that was created explicitly for this demo. It is based on the template, and I'm going to show you the template in a second. To answer your question, there are hooks inside the configuration file. 
these are the most abbreviated hooks that I use to create this uh, environment. I just I, I wanted to know whether it was doable with this scheme or. Yeah. Um, let's see if I can come up with it this way. Um, let's see there. I don't need the demo. It's, it's, it's uh, quite what circumstances I need to change. Yeah. But as long as it's doable and, and not rocket science, that'll be fine. Uh, let's see, uh, ah, there, let's see, streaming. streaming. Well, I'm doing this as much for myself as it is for you. There it is. The etsybarman.conf uh, has a complete suite of hooks and includes also post and pre instructions for a particular barman activity. You can actually put in the script. For example, you're talking about trimming down a, a system. If you can do it manually, you can script that in the configuration file. The configuration parameters in this file are very detailed. They can be copied and moved into server-specific configuration files in the subdirectories. They're very, very flexible. It starts with defaults that is across all of the servers, but you can customize by just copying the parameters and putting them in the server-specific configuration files. And I have now 33 minutes after the hour. <laughs> I can, if you're willing, five minutes, and I can go through the, the build environment very, very quickly. You guys are really nice. Okay. So this is on GitLab. This is a build environment. Let's walk through this quickly. Uh, what I'm doing is I'm going to talk through the steps of what, what we're done here. Um, and reading it at leisure in your own time will help you decide how you want to create your environment. Basically, I ran this script and it created the environment. And I just refined it so I'd have all my, all the, the assumptions that I need to configure things would be taken into account. So I'm creating passwords and I'm holding on to them. And those passwords are going to be used for the different uh, edge cases. Passwords for uh, uh, Postgres. There are two user accounts in Barman, creating passwords there. I've created a template in my Linux containers. I call it template CentOS 7. And I'm using that as my base for my Barman server, my Postgres server. I broke them up because I wanted to make the point that they don't have to have the same packages. They're just different. So in this case, I go to the community. The community has the packages. I download them. And line 27 is kind of cool. You know, let's make our password. In this case, passwords are really simple. Uh, then I create my first Postgres server. Since the server is basically consistent with the other two, there's certain operations that basically I'm going to copy the template over and it's going to be my two and my three. So again, the same routine. I download the packages. I install them. Notice Barman CLI. They were installed in Barman. But this is where they could be used. These are convenience utilities. There's more detail in the, pack, in the documentation of Barman that tell you how you can use them and they give examples too. Basically, they are convenience utilities for pulling in a wall and pushing a wall out. Again, set passwords. Now I'm, I'm going to specific configuration information because it's a master. I'm putting in the information for the authentication file. I'm generating on line 61 my keys, and I'm using SSH Pass so I can actually log in remotely without typing in manually that password so I can ship over the private public keys properly. And of course, PG Pass and PG SQL Profile, these are permissions. PG Pass is where I'm going to hold my username passwords. If it's globally accessible, Postgres will refuse to read the file because it's a security breach. Now I'm making my containers. 
Now I'm starting up, set up a more configuration issues. And here I'm connecting into the, the container itself. I've got the server running and I separated these. These are the actual instructions that I've used to make master slave work and to make barman work. So they're isolated. I didn't put them in the postgresql.conf. I just wanted to say, okay, these are special. And this is a good, an easy way to make them distinct. Here's a little trick. Line 101, archive command. Normally, if you do an archive command and you change it, you have to do a restart. But if you start and you say true, and then you change the command while it's under production conditions, you just sync up, just reload the configuration file. It'll read it dynamically. It's a little hack. You don't have to restart the server. Okay. Passwords, encrypted passwords. I'm creating the roles for Barman on lines 105, 106. And I'm using the documentation that Barman had. I call it Barman and Streaming Barman. Restart the servers. Uh, I like man pages, so I update the man pages. Then I go into the second server, and the second server is basically slave. Uh, and there's the command to make the slave, starting on 127. That's a base backup. I'm manually doing a base backup to make my slave. This is independent of bar mesh. Then I make it active, sleep, and then I go to barman and I configure it here. And again, basically the same kind of routine. Set the passwords, make sure that it can talk to the other servers. And you can see here in the bottom on line 157, there's that little test to see that it can access. Very fast, very brief, um, and that's it in a, in a very big walnut. I hope it was hopeful, uh, helpful and constructive. And uh, thanks for being patient. <laughs> Questions? Yes? You said you were using these sort of things for DR. What yes. would you suggest to be rather than having a delay of the, the, the um, logs that are shipped? There is a way. If you use a traditional log shipping, let me show you a configuration file for Postgres. Let's see. Okay. Right here on line 219. This is the archive command. This is one of the key configuration um, options, parameters that you need to adjust uh, to, for all the issues. Now, if you wanted to delay, one of the techniques is to actually use log shipping, use the rsync, but you use a user-defined script. It could be any language. Personally, I use Bash all the time. You point to that script, and inside the script, it's going to have the copy of the rsync, and you'll have a delay. You put a sleep. And if you want to be fancier, you could put conditional logic as to when you should ship that log. These were actually when, back in the, in the mid 2000s, when standby servers were first created, a lot of capabilities were still missing compared to today, and the community became aware of hacks. Mm -hmm. And one of them, some guy, had hacked that way by, in, in, by creating a very complicated bash script that took into account a very sophisticated environment. And the guys were impressed. So much so, they created a company and they called the utility called Barman. Um, there was a lot of good ideas that came out. And this is one of these things that I tell you that you have this ability to adapt the environment. It is a given. Anything you want, you can do it. It's just a question of being patient and not finding out the solution, but finding out the most appropriate solution, because there's more than one way of always doing something when it comes to Linux and Postgres. So the key to it is to understand the business requirements and then implement it rather than just uh, pretty much using whatever the default is. Pretty much. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions?
Don't ask me about the coffee. I just drink it. I don't have any tea. Sometimes I have good coffee. <laughs> All right, so uh, to reiterate, if you go back to the page on, our, on the Linux Fest, you'll find in the profile, on my profile there, you'll find the actual GitLab path. So you can go there, you can download everything. And as I said, this environment was created inside the Linux using containers. But you know, once you understand the code, you can do anything you want. And those were LXC containers? Yes, they are Linux containers. Um, I've been using them for a, lot of t a long time. I found, unbiasedly, um, I'm rather impatient. When Linux containers, I have the network stack already incorporated in the system. With Docker, part of the development time is tuning Docker. And it, it's just a, pres a preference on my part. I, I, I like... Um, not worrying about the OS as much as possible and just focus on the configuration issues. I, I, I give that responsibility to other people. Docker has its great advantages. I'm not taking advantage of, of those things. I'm just creating an environment very simply. And in Linux containers in a VM environment, it's really great to, because I just pull them up, pitch them up, regrow them. All right, um, questions, other questions? All right. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for coming. And uh, I hope you got something out of this. Absolutely. Can't wait to dive in.